Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Way T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. And boy, oh boy, you want to listen to this today because we are going to talk about how sugar is affecting the body and making people more susceptible to illness. But more importantly, I'm going to introduce our special guest today, Dr. Richard Jacoby, who has treated thousands of patients with peripheral neuropathy. And you want to know about this because it is a horrible condition. Now he shares his insights as well as the story behind how he connected the dots to determine how sugar is the common denominator of many chronic diseases. I think today, if it was actually released, it'd be a schedule one drug. In Sugar Crush, he offers a unique holistic approach to understanding the exacting toll sugar and carbs take on the body. Based on his clinical work, he breaks down his highly effective methods showing how dietary changes, reducing sugar and wheat, coincide with an increase of good fats can dramatically help regenerate nerves and rehabilitate their normal functions. Dr. Jacoby, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. This, we talked just for a couple of seconds and we got, we went from sugar right to stem cells. And I'm like, we got to stop right now because this whole thing with sugar, I mean, let's talk about sugar. Let's just, what's your experience? Maybe give a little bit of background about your credentials and then how you got onto this whole uh, topic about sugar and its impact and what we can do about it. Well, I've been doing this for a long time. My training is as a podiatrist, which makes me sound like un, um, involved in this process. But when you really think about it, diabetic polyneuropathy is the number one problem in the United States. And I think you are from, I, I didn't ask you. Originally from Canada, but I'm living in Venice Beach, California. Oh, you lucky guy. So you're on the beach. And you were from Canada. Um, I trained with a fellow by the name of Lee Dellen, who his partner at the time was uh, Susan McKenna from Canada, by the mm -hmm. way. And he had a novel or has a novel approach to diabetic neuropathy. I met him after a lecture about 20 years ago. And he's from Johns Hopkins, a professor of neurosurgery. And he was doing decompressions of nerves of the lower extremity. I went up to him after the lecture and I had never heard of this uh, technique. And he said to me, why do you podiatrist cut the nerve out of the foot when that's the only nerve cut out? And I said, well, that's what we're trained to do as everybody was. He said, I'm going to show you a different way. He invited me down to Johns Hopkins. I did go down there. I read his textbooks. I re read, most of his articles, he's published at least 700 articles on this topic. Sugar is the common denominator of nerve compression. And that means the nerves of the lower extremity are being compressed physically by the chemical reaction of sugar that causes the numbness, the tingling, the burning, the loss of balance. And his novel approach is to decompress these nerves. Now, how did he come to that conclusion? Well, about 1984, a patient of his had carpal tunnel, and she said to him, Dr. Dellen, why don't you fix my legs? And he said, well, that's a different disease. He went to the laboratory, did tremendous research on this subject, came up with the conclusion that diabetic neuropathy is the same thing as carpal tunnel. And he's a professor in neurosurgery, He's got the credentials and the laboratory to figure all this stuff out. I met him in the year 2000. He introduced me to the subject. I brought it back to Scottsdale. I brought it to the wound care center, which I helped found about 35 years ago. I did thousands of these procedures. It works, but there was no research that big pharma likes us to do. So you have to do millions and millions of dollars worth of research on a surgical topic. It's hard to do. Mm -hmm. It's been done. He's right. And it works. So 
I made the mistake about 15 years ago. I said, Dr. Dellen, by that, by that time, I was allowed to call him Lee, first name. I said, Lee, I think there's more to your, your topic. And he said, why don't you figure it out? I said, well, and he didn't say it nicely. So, I mean, he, I was treading on his theory. So I said, well, I'll start reading outside the box. I started reading articles. Uh, I got lucky in the beginning, a, a doctor um, at Stanford, uh, his name is John Cook with an E, if people want to look it up. He wrote an article in 2004 in Circulation Journal, and it was called the Uber Marker. And his molecule was asymmetric dimethyl arginine. Now, this is just around the time when they got the Nobel Prize for the uh, finding out that nitric oxide even existed. It was called the um, uh, relaxing factor, syndrome X, basically. So I text him, he calls me on the phone like two hours after I mentioned that to him. He said, come up to Stanford, let's look at that. I did, I'm speed this story up, it's a really long story. So I tested my patients with his molecule and I made the link between diabetic neuropathy, ulnar, ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, carpal tunnel, and MS. And I said, wait a minute, the biochemistry is the same, the physiology is the same, the symptoms are very similar to all these diseases. Numbness, tingling, burning, well, that's the autonomic nervous system, that's the beginning of this process. So I did all this work with him, and he said, well, quit your practice, come up, work with me at Stanford, um, and we'll figure this out. And then Dr. Dellen said, come down to Johns Hopkins, work with me. So I was in between these two great institutions. I said, no, I'll write a book because it's gonna take 15 years to figure it out. And it did, and I was right. And that is the correct answer to this really complicated question. So what is ADMA, asymmetric dimethyl arginine? It is really just another manifestation of sugar. High fructose corn syrup in particular, I believe is that sugar. So when you look at the literature and let me just segue back. Actually, I started thinking about it 40 years ago. I was asked by the Surgeon General of Taiwan to, to go there to figure out why they had diabetes 40 years ago. His name is Dr. Luke Chu. He was a MD, PhD in pharmacology. He said, why do we have diabetes? Well, I went all over the country. I went there many times. And I said, I can't find anybody who has diabetes. It was very rare 40 years ago, but now it's very prevalent. I said, by the way, what's the word for diabetes in Mandarin? He said, diabetes. I said, well, that's a Greek word. You really don't have a word to explain the symptoms you're seeing. It's got to be the diet. I mean, I guess it could be meteorites hitting people in the head and maybe that's causing it, but I think it's probably the diet. But what in the diet, I did not know. I really didn't. But I went all the, I, I set up their clinics. I went all over the place, back and forth a couple of years, and I was convinced it was the diet. Now it's interesting, recently an, an article came out that uh, looked at a voluminous uh, a study on 20 years of history on, I think it was 37 countries looking at the cashier, cashier receipts of fast food restaurants. So let's say there's 20 variables in that from the meat, the cheese, the bread, the soda, the ketchup, the whatever. And what do you think the number one variable in diabetes was? Sugar. And where was that? It was in the drinks. Number one, yeah, it's in the meat, it's in the bread, it's in the cheese, but number one is sugar. There's no arguing. This is a huge study. So now we know it's sugar. Where is it coming from? How is it made? And really what's the biochemistry of this process and how does it produce all these diseases? So one of the questions I asked Dr. Cook if anybody wants to look up that article, it's in Circulation Journal, 2004. Cook's name is with an E at the end. It's called the Uber Marker. So I said, Dr. Cook, you've written 500 articles. Please don't make me read every one of them. Although I did read a lot of them. 
give me the bottom line. He's a great guy, great investigator. And I said, the first question I have this cholesterol problem. I really don't understand it. Now, this is 15 years ago. I said, what does cholesterol have to do with anything? And here is his answer. He said, the lining of the blood vessel is called the endothelium. In his words, it's like Teflon. When you eat sugar, it makes the lining like Velcro. So a signaling molecule, which is cholesterol, is signaling to go to the scene of the accident, puts down cholesterol. We call that plaque. Keep eating sugar, you keep building up plaque, hardening of the arteries. So I did a deep dive on that subject. And I'm telling you, I don't know if this is these investigators are all paid off or they're just stupid. I'm not sure. I'll let the audience figure that one out. But I saw them as very, very bright guys. So let's go back to 1863. This guy's name is um, Verkal. Spoke five languages. He was the first one I could find. He opened up an artery in 1863, looked at the artery, and he said in English, what is this gunk? And gunk in Greek is athro. And if it's hard, it's atherosclerosis. That's what he saw. That's not a diagnosis. That's an observation, which was a good one. What is in the gunk? The gunk is cholesterol. Aha, we learn if we lower cholesterol, that disease will go away. Absolutely not true. But we just hit a trillion dollars of taking statin drugs for no reason. Well, good reason if you have a high mortgage, I guess. <laughs> the answer is sugar. And that's what it is. And it always had been sugar. So cholesterol is actually just a marker of the inflammatory response in the body because of this roughing of the artery. Is that, would that be a... Yeah, so sugar causes inflammation, mm -hmm. which irritates the endothelium. Mm -hmm. And cholesterol is a healing molecule and it'll go to the area of the, of the uh, inflammation. It's like an accident outside. You hear a siren every day. You look out the window and you never see the accident, but you hear the siren signal signal and you look out and you say wow i'll bet you ambulances are causing accidents because you don't see anything else right that's how that happened not only if that was sinister or just uh, how it happened or whatever but that's another story for another day so a lot of investigators from there to where we are in the present so that was one question i had that was answered so it is sugar which one and how is it made? And why are we eating so much? Well, the answer is, it tastes great. And high fructose corn syrup is a liquid form and even tastes better. So let's look at the U USDA and all this sort of thing, the food pyramid. It says, eat six to 11 helpings of grains at the bottom of the pyramid. Well, uh, it's possible. That's hard to do, by the way. That's a lot of grains. A lot of grain. A lot of grain. And then fruit is on the next level, and then you get up to maybe some fat. Well, it's upside down. But if you're selling grains, that's a good thing to follow. Mm -hmm. And that was that's the United States Department of Agriculture. Now you're in Venice Beach. You have, at least you get vitamin D there on the beach. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not getting the right nutrients to begin with because of that government agency telling us the absolutely the wrong thing. Absolutely. And we're paying our tax dollars to get us sick. Okay. And it's being subsidized. Now it's high fructose corn syrup. And I don't know if your audience knows how that's made, but, and it's not exactly made the way it is that when I was doing my studies, but we take the, first of all, it's grown with genetically modified corn. Correct. And that's a whole big issue. I don't know if you had Stephanie Seneff on your show. Not yet, but that's... Yeah, and Stephanie's coming out and should have her on. She's coming out with a new book in June, which will explain that whole process in detail. But I met her about uh, 10 years ago, and she's a, a, from MIT, and she knows the whole physiology and biochemistry of the shikimate pathway is what your microbiome is all about. So I texted her and said, hey, Steph, uh, help me through this one. She's written a lot of papers. 
And she did, and she was a wonderful person and walked me through this pathway. So genetically modified corn really means that Monsanto's corn that makes or makes the seed and the herbicide glyphosate, which is the active ingredient. So that means you take the gene out, put a new gene in, corn can grow, everything else dies. They went through the FDA. See, that's another government agency, isn't it? Yeah. So they went through that and they got passed because they never checked the shikimate pathway in the gut. Bacteria use that pathway. Bacteria love sugar. So I'll just segue over to the vagus nerve because we looked at MS in this whole equation. So the, these organisms in your gut, and there are about 500 to 1,000 organisms, they, they love sugar. And they're going to send a signal to your hippocampus in your brain. And that's the craving you get. I can't live without this stuff. It's a love-hate relationship. But the guys in your gut, they're telling you to do that up the vagus nerve to your hippocampus. Three things that the hippocampus does. Number one, long-term memory linked to Alzheimer's. Number two, your craving, your addiction center. And number three, the olfactory nerve. And I find that interesting one because that is big, big problem in our society today. Alzheimer's. When you do a volumetric MRI of the hippocampus, it shrinks up over time because it's being affected by sugar. So you lose your memory, but you know what you lose first? The sense of smell. Right. Yes. So that relates back to Dr. Dellen. So now I'm back. So now I'm out of Stanford, back with Dr. Dellen, said, look what I learned here. And I said, you know what? I think your theory that carpal tunnel, ulnar tunnel, and their name tunnels in the lower extremity, the tarsal tunnel and the fibular tunnel, et cetera. If there's true, and this is true, and that is true, why would not all the tunnels be true with the same biochemistry? So Dr. Dellen says to me, oh, I don't know about that. And yeah, where's your proof? And he's, he's a good, good scientist. But I said, it's my hypothesis, uh, but I, I'm going to try to prove it but I have to at least articulate it first. And I, I don't have 15 years and I don't have your budget at NIH. So I'll write a book and that's what Sugar Crush the book is about. Oh, so that's what it's- A great about. story to get to the book. That's a, that's a, a that's an, an, how many decades did this take? Well, if you think about it, it probably took me 40 years from that first cognition from Dr. Chu to say, what's the Mandarin word for, for uh, uh, diabetes? And I went, gee, you have to have the problem to have a word to describe it. Then that's when I went back to all these itises, I like to call them. So let's, let's talk about MS. So what does MS mean? Multiple sclerosis. Gee, there's that word again. Right. Hardening, sclerosis. Well, another guy, he was in France. His name was Charcot, just about the same time, 1860s. So he was treating a patient with numbness, tingling, burning, difficulty walking. And at the autopsy section, that person's brain looked at it and saw these little white spots on the brain and the cervical area of the spine. And he named it multiple areas of white spots, which we know as MS, multiple sclerosis. Now, where is that a disease? That's an observation. What is causing these white spots? I think the answer is sugar. Causes inflammation, the body heals by scarring, fibrosis, and it chokes off the nerves, in this particular case, the vagus nerve, and you have two of them, they're coming out of your neck. And that's what we saw with Dr. Cook's molecule asymmetric dimethyl arginine at the beginning of this cascade of symptoms. Now, when I argue, and I do argue quite often every day, I just had a good argument. <laughs> so, and, and, the, and the, 
it's interesting, and I and I actually like this argument because, well, you're a podiatrist. What would you know about that? I said, that's interesting. Why would I know that when you're the expert in that disease and you don't have a clue? And the answer is because I have a different look at it. I'm not an investigator in there and just make an observation like Vercal or Charcot did. It's up to real scientists to pick that apart and disprove what I'm saying. And I guarantee you, you can't. But they're looking for a drug. They're looking for a drug to take and never telling the patient to stop eating sugar because that's where the money is. To treat the symptom, not the cause, which is the New England Journal of Medicine says that we treat the symptoms of disease. Of course, because that's where the money is. They asked Willie Sutton, you're from Canada. I don't know if you know that name. Do you know Willie Sutton? Uh, no. He was a famous bank robber in the 50s. Okay. So he would rob banks all the time. They oh, and that's where the money is. That's where the money is. Yes. That's why you rob banks. That's why you make drugs, because that's where the money is. Now, I'm not saying that's sinister, but it is if you have MS and you're really not getting the truth. The answer is sugar. It is. And Canadians, by the way, have a much higher prevalence for MS. And you have a lot of wheat in, in Canada. Mm -hmm. And that's a carbohydrate. And it's, I don't know if that particular stuff is made with glyphosate, but I suspect it is. Yeah, it, there is a big issue um, in wheat production. And of course, the agricultural and federal government and subsidies, and then the use of uh, genetically modified Monsanto crops, which is now owned by Bayer, which is a uh -huh. company. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the under, I believe it was the Obama administration, that they uh, allowed, they gave a pass for Monsanto to be ever sued. Oh, yes. For, yes. for uh, the contamination of genetically modified crops with non genetically, because these killer seeds spread. And then Monsanto was actually suing farmers in, uh, in Alberta because they found their genetically modified seeds in their garden. And they were, so it was like totally backwards to uh, what seemed to be sensible, which is a deep, deep you know, bag of, of, of poo that people can take a look at and start to wonder. But let's get back to this. I, I love the fact that you pointed out that multiple sclerosis and fibrosis and quote unquote hardening of the arteries and neuropathy all had a common element to this. It's, a, it's a, an inflammatory response that's building up this plaque tissue, which is leading to this, I guess the shutting off of oxygen and all these sort of things for, oh, for brain function, right? Oh. So continue on with this and, and why you wrote the book that you did after four decades of investigative <laughs> research in order to kind of come up here and say, hey, not only does this apply to my discipline, but it has an extensive application to everything else. And thus for people looking I guess there's one piece I want to look at. Thus, people looking to optimize their health need to consider this, but you mentioned something about in Canada, which we do have a lot of wheat-based products, but I've also noticed in the States, particularly the Southern States and also into Latin America, I've lived down there as well. There's a lot of corn-based products. So are we seeing a difference in say that the, the, the types of diseases related to corn versus wheat-based? Is there? Yeah, I think that's a very good observation. They're all carbohydrates, but certainly there, there's different subtly, subtleness, how the biochemistry works. And that brings it to another subject called epigenetics. Yes. Okay. So I like to introduce the, your group to that word if they don't know that word and how it works. So we all have subtle differences in our genetic makeup. So, and we have to, we have to have biodiversity. So if a meteorite went off tomorrow morning and we got 7 billion people on the planet, I guarantee you there'll be a million or so people that could breathe sulfuric acid right. and they would live and the rest of us would die. Because right. that's how organisms face un uh, unknowns by biodiversity. So that's a good word that's, that's really, it's in the news all the time, but not really applied to biology. But 
a little bit later in our discussion, we'll talk about COVID-19 and those little guys called viruses and how they fit into this whole equation. And that's part of the, part of the deal. So I started to look at the cranial nerves and I, but I, I took a different approach. I wanted to know what's the number one symptom, like MS, numbness, tingling, burning, and loss of mo motor control. Exactly the same symptoms of diabetic neuropathy. Carpal tunnel, same thing. Ulnar tunnel, same thing. Um, uh, next one is the uh, ninth cranial nerve, which is ALS. Now, most people that are pretty hip, they go, yeah, A I know that. Well, do you really? Do you know what it means? Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Oh, I know that. Well, do you know what that word means? No. Here's that what it means. A in Latin is no. Myotrophic means the muscle function. Lateral because you're one cranial nerve on either side of your neck. And there's our good word sclerosis again. So no muscle function on either side of the neck because of sclerotic hardening of the glossopharyngeal nerve primarily. There's some other nerves involved in that. And that nerve is part of your reflex to swallow. If you can't swallow, the saliva goes in your lungs and you die. It takes about five years. So let's go back to carpal tunnel. Is that the same as car carpal tunnel? Yes, in my opinion. So we have a nerve, the median nerve. We have a muscle and we have a function. So what causes this on the wrist? My, my formula is trauma plus sugar equals nerve dysfunction. So back to Dr. Dellen. So I brought that up to him. He said, well, and he always likes to say, you, you don't say Johns Hopkins if you went there. It's kind of a woke thing for Johns Hopkins. You can say, if you went there, Hopkins, because that's the N word to say. And so they said, well, you know, we have like seven Nobel laureates here to say you're, to me that I'm wrong. So now I'm arguing with the Nobel laureates, which is intimidating. And what they were saying to me was that small fiber neuropathy, which is the autonomic nervous system, uh, now this is going back 15 years, is a separate and distinct disease than large fiber. And that's what was known 15 years ago. I am saying and did say then that small fiber and large fiber are nothing more than the continuum of the inflammatory process from very small axons, which are the smallest units of nerves, to the very large myelinated motor nerves. So it really goes from unmyelinated to myelinated. The thicker the insulation, the more electricity goes through the nerve, and the more work that it does. Seems that rather logical to me but not to these laureates. Yeah. I have a question about that. And one of the things that I've noticed um, inside the diversity of medical designation. So, you know, if you go to your general practice medical advisor, he kind of says, okay, well, I'm seeing some, you know, some markers here. Let's send you to a specialist. That specialist is highly, uh, you, you know, trained in that particular condition, but not in anything else. And he'll notice something and they're like, well, you know, we need to send you to another specialist. And then that specialist tells about that. But each one of these individuals are living in kind of an isolated compartment with its own education system, its own experts, its own kind of almost a tribalism related to that specific field and avoid com commenting in other areas and departments. It, do you think that conditioning um, leads very intelligent, hard-driven scientists to become compartmentalized in their conclusions and, and, and not thinking in turn of the whole body, but just in that specific area in general? Wow, you really articulated that well. And that discussion has gone on. And the word for that is they're all in their own silos. Correct. Which gives even a more definitions and compartmental because you're isolated in this department, a silo. 
in a vertical thinking. And they're not cross pollinating these ideas the way I think I did in Sugar Crush. And it was, it was I shouldn't say it was easy, but I had, a, I had an advantage because I was coming from a much different point of view. I knew the terminology they were all speaking of, but I could see the manifestation in the lower extremity. And I use the word, see, people have small fiber neuropathy, and I'll explain that a little bit more detail in a second. I call that the clarion sign of this disease process. It's noisy, it's painful. So people who get small fiber neuropathy, their symptoms are burning. It's, it's very painful. Whereas if let's say you had autonomic neuropathy of your heart, it's not painful. You might get atrial fib, fluttering of your heart muscle. Oh gee, there it is again. Small, small nerve innervating a muscle, doing a different function. And what is causing an aberration, as I like to say, I think it's sugar. That's what AFib is. And it's causing sclerosis of the autonomic interruption and you get a, a muscle problem and that function is deadly. So in the leg, it's noisy. It's not deadly in the beginning, but a sudden cardiac arrest is deadly. As I say, I'm trying to get a new book out. One of the chapters is dead is a bad symptom. <laughs> That's a symptom you don't want. That's one you don't come back from. <laughs> right. So, but the clarion, noisy, painful, get my attention, do something symptom of small fiber neuropathy. Now, why is that? And that just bothered me for a long time to get the right answer. And I think this is the answer. So fibromyalgia is one of those symptoms, and that's a descriptive term because they hurt all over, fibro, muscle, myalgia. Well, it's the small fiber nerves, and small fiber nerves are, I don't know if you can see that, say that's the dermis, and here comes the nerves through the dermis into the epidermis. They're unmyelinated not insulated. Now we're talking microscopic. So anything we have in our environment from food to anything else, even sunlight, is going to irritate those nerves. And you're going to have pain and the symptom is burning. So that's the very, very first symptom of I hurt all over. And it's got to be from what you're eating. And my studies say, yes, it is sugar. And we'll get into that biochemistry in a little bit if you want to before everybody falls asleep. But think of a light bulb. Light bulb is well insulated. You take the filament, you peel back the insulation, electricity goes through and it heats up the filament and you have light. That's its function. If you take off the uh, insulation and connect it to a motor, you have a motor motor myop, it moves things. So it has big insulation, more electricity, more watts. I mean, that's the theory. So what I was saying 15 years ago, this is not a separate and distinct disease. Although the argument back to me was, back then was like Tangier's disease can it, is a hereditary disease. You're born, you get it, and that's it. And that's why they thought it was a separate disease. 50 people had it, for God's sake, in the whole world. Now millions of people have small fiber neuropathy. It's caused by sugar, affects the autonomic first, then the sensory, and then the motor. That was not known back then. But I'm arguing with even my own professor. And, and it was funny because they gang up on me and say, see, you don't understand. What, I, I understood what you were saying, but I didn't agree with what you're saying. That's two different right. conclusions. It's not that I didn't understand you were saying. I just don't agree with it. But when they say it's a Nobel laureate said it, well, how do, how do you argue that? How do you argue with a Nobel laureate because yeah. well, for you to possibly condemn the, 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 holy, the, the holy purveyors of truth? Right, in the silo, and I was trapped. Right. But at a higher level, and Dr. Dellon and Dr. Cook are at that high level, 
They are super intellects. They really are. They've written hundreds of papers. They're very, very tuned in to what is the real cause. And they would be great guys to interview, by the way. And then I met some people from uh, Harvard um, and a guy from uh, University of Washington. Um, his name is uh, Paul, last name is Paul, P-A-L-L. -L, and he's into this whole electromagnetic field 5G issue, which mm -hmm. is, actually has something to do with what I'm talking about, by the way. Beautiful. But too much to talk about, and, but it, it is a trauma. And traumatized nerves, when you're holding it, I'll just get this for real quick. If you're holding this next to your ear and you have a 5G and you're eating a lot of sugar and it's inflamed, you're gonna, you're gonna have problems. And I think that this glioblastoma elevation prevalence is real. And glioblastomas are coming from this process. I got it. So going back to this um, formula, the simplified formula, when you combine the trauma, regardless of its source, combined with sugar equals the dysfunction and often shows up as a sclerosis, uh, this, this plaque building up as a, as a repair mechanism and you become essentially a victim of your own repair mechanisms because of too much trauma and 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 a condition that leads to this the sugar formation is as a negative consequence. Would that be an accurate assessment? More than accurate. Which okay. Part? So, yeah. So the traumas. When I looked at the physics of that, so you have gravitational trauma, um, just wear and tear, and like the keyboard. That's why carpal tunnel was thought to be that. But that was 1974. So let's talk about carpal tunnel because that's where this theory came from with Dr. Dellen. And the guys, two guys prior to that, and their names were um, Upton and McComas, and they wrote a paper in Lancet on the double crush syndrome. So that's why my book is called Sugar Crush. And here's the answer to that. So Dr. Dellen was looking at the carpal tunnel and he had a lot to do with its development and surgery and he, just phenomenal human being but 1974 the um, uh, home computers came out so everybody's right. ah the trauma from doing that is causing uh, repetitive motion injuries which is a factor but you know what was next to that p keyboard can of coke i was just going to say 1970s we're talking about the marlboro man and have a coke and a smile you got it. And the Coke. There should have been have a Coke and a syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 1974 is when high fructose corn syrup was replaced. They were replacing that into the into Coke, Coca-Cola. What was it, the source? I, what was the source before that? It was uh, beet sugar and cane sugar. Now in Mexico, they continue to use cane sugar and also they continue to use glass bottles, which that's why a lot of people say, well, I like Coke from Mexico because it's in glass containers and it's real sugar, still bad, but actually better than what we were doing here. Right, and I course, plastics is another issue. I mean, I have a high level uh, concierge client that I'm dealing with right now and we we found extraordinarily high levels of plastics inside his body, and maybe you could comment just a little about that because we're starting to see this more and more inside of tissues of humans. They're becoming plastified, and I don't know of any methods to remove plastics out of the body. Do you? And now for a Biooptimizer's fixed digestion tip: supercharge your protein, Jake. Everyone knows protein shakes are a great way to sneak in extra protein, build more muscle, even replace meals and burn more fat. The problem is the highest quality protein typically absorbs at around 40%. One way to fix this and dramatically increase how quickly and effective your protein shake digests is to add two to three capsules of Masszymes into your shake. 
One research study showed that pre-digested protein during a meal increased muscle growth significantly. To take advantage of this, just blend the open capsules into your shake and within 15 minutes or less, the enzymes will have begun to break down the protein into amino acids. This can make your shakes at least two to three times more potent. Some people do this and sip on their shake while lifting to provide their muscles with a steady stream of amino acids during their workout. To save 10% on masszymes, use the code SHAKE10, that's S-H-A-K-E-10, at masszymes.com. That's SHAKE10 at masszymes.com. I don't. And an article just came out for animals as well for that very issue, and they are. We all are. So I don't know what you can do about that once it's in there, because we don't have any enzymes that break down that particular process. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's going to be a big deal, or is a big deal. Mm -hmm. So and this is how I was thinking. So then I went to look at as many different itises that I could. And one of the itises I also had myself. So let's go back in time. So this is... Probably 35 years ago, I'm going to go skiing, um, and I get this severe pain in my right lower quadrant. I go back, get an ultrasound. I have a gallstone. Well, I it, the pain is unbelievable. So I treat it. Oh, well, that's diet, isn't it? Eating too much fat, isn't it? That's the prevailing diet. Oh, I don't eat a lot of fat. I should eat more fat. I should not eat any fat. What do you eat if you don't eat fat? Carbs and protein. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I get another attack. And then I had the surgery. I was on my way to ski and I turn around. I said, I can't go up on the mountain with this thing. So I'll get it out of there. I'll speed this story up. So that was about 35 years ago. And I'm thinking about it. And I go into the lunchroom at the hospital. At that time, I was just pretty much doing hospital surgery in the wound care center, gangrene and all that sort of thing. And one of the family doctors there, he says, what happened to you? And I said, I had my gallbladder out. And he said, ah, that's because you don't exercise your gallbladder enough, just to be funny. And he's got a big plate of food and he was a pretty good sized guy. And I thought to myself, that's how you think. You go, well, you know, maybe he's right. I never ate breakfast. I did surgery early. I had cream and sugar in my coffee. I ate uh, the bagels and crap, and then had a big hospital lunch, which was probably all carbs. And then I saw some patients, then I went to the gym, and went to the gym every day in my life. My weight was creeping up, even though I was going to the gym. But I satisfied or rewarded myself with food, just sure. like everybody else did. Right. And so anyway, so that's in the back of my mind. Um, I'm starting to think about neuropathy. I run into Dr. Dellen. He introduces me to the concept of nerve compression. I'm really doing a deep dive. Now, this is the Canadian connect connection number two. No, number three. Susan McKenna, we and now Dr. Um, his name is spelled D-Y-C-K. Now, I don't know how to pronounce that name, and I'm giving a lecture, and a friend of mine who was at the Mayo Clinic, where actually we practiced together, he's a neurologist. So I called him up and said, um, hey, Jeff, I said, how do you pronounce that name? I, I don't know what team he's playing on. Right. <laughs> how do you pronounce that name? Is it Dick or Dyke? D-Y-C-K. That's hilarious. I know, I'm bad. And he's, he's a Canadian, and his actual, his, uh, his first name, yeah, Peter. Oh, no. So his name, yeah, I know, I know. That's Peter hilarious. Dick. But he's Canadian. He doesn't know our slang down here at Venice Beach. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, did I mention his son is a neurologist as well? They're both neurologists. World famous. Wow. Junior. Oh, man, that's funny. I know. Big Dick and Little Dick had a theory. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they don't beat me up if they ever meet me. I'm sure they're used to I'm sure they're used to it. Sure I don't know. Uh, so, but the senior, <laughs> the 
senior doctor will go with that. He wrote a, a textbook on peripheral neuropathy, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Of course, I had to read this thing to figure out what was going on. And so beautifully written book. He's head of Mayo Clinic's neurology department. And in that book, he says, people who had their gallbladder out go on to have diabetes. And I had my gallbladder out. And I went, and I'm in the wound care center. And so let's say a patient came in. I say, hi, Mr. Jones, what can I do for you? I see, oh, that foot smells horrible. You got gangrene. Uh, let me go through your history. You take this, that, and the other thing, you're diabetic. Oh, you had your gallbladder out 25 years before. Hmm. You had cardiac disease. Hmm. And I'm thinking, is this me 25 years from now? Right. Not knowing the answer to the question. And sure enough, 50% of the patients who have diabetic neuropathy and go on to have gangrene do have their gallbladders out. So what is the connection? Now I'm really all in. So this is 35 years ago. And I'm thinking about this. Then I run into Dr. Dellen. I go, nerve, muscle, gallbladder, function. I go, wait a minute. If you don't eat fat, which they still tell you today, don't eat fat, you're gonna be eating carbs. That's what I was doing. So sugar through the biochemical pathways, first one is autonomic. So signal goes down to your gallbladder, down the nerve to the muscle, and it squeezes and shoots out some bile into your intestine. Now, if it doesn't fully empty doesn't fully work, it will leave some cholesterol again in the bile duct. It clogs it with a stone because it keeps building up. Again, they go there, you know the answer. Oh, it's cl hard to cholesterol. You could call it Sclerosis, if you wanted to. If you wanted to. They call it'd be it actually, can, it'd be like gallbladder sclerosis as opposed exactly. to, as to the creation of a quote-unquote stone. Correct. Which is, so which there's is cholesterol that again. stone so, be made out of, just, to, just so people make sure they got the conclusion. Yeah, it's cholesterol in there, and it's and hard, and blocks it, and it's painful. Mm -hmm. so I did have it out. Mm -hmm. That was 35 years ago. Now, I've... I would have changed my diet, number one. I didn't. But my mother had her gallbladder out. And um, I had a brother actually had it. And so I thought in my mind, oh, this is um, hereditary. But it really epigenetic. I'm, we're carrying that particular gene that expresses on that nerve, where you may have it and you're drinking Coke and you're doing the typewriter and this nerve or this nerve or that nerve. So that's why they're all called different diseases because each one of those silos is popping out a itis answer. Right. They don't see the connection. Right. And big pharma doesn't want you to see that connection. <laughs> yeah, or I even, just say they don't. Even, but, even, even how could they even potentially see it if they're siloing their, their research and their definitions from experts within those fields who are looking to find a drug that can offset the condition. So even nefarious kind of projections aside, mm -hmm. and I'm, 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 I'm one that would be more likely to be nefarious just so people would know, you could reasonably say how a great number of well-meaning people could come to a, an erroneous conclusion because of being too much of a specialist and not enough of a generalist to be able to know patterns over multiple areas of the human condition. Well said. It's, I mean, that's exactly what happened. Done this in a lecture. I, I, I like to offend everybody if I can, you know. <laughs> so... To, to be the this point, so I was looking through the literature, and this guy Bruno's name came up, 1508. He was a monk in the Vatican, and he went to the Vatican. He says, hey, you know, I think the earth is not the center of the universe, and, you know, the sun and the reality. And, oh, Bruno, let's back off a little bit. <laughs> That's not the accepted deal. And he kept it up. He said, tell you what, Bruno, 
we're going to take you downstairs. Got a nice room downstairs. The Vatican. It's a true story in the Vatican. He was there for about three years. A little slap therapy to come to a sense. It's kind of like they were doing to me. Yes, but real slaps. Comes yeah. up and he said, "What do you think?" Well, he had three years to think about it. He said, "Well, you know, that's a good question." Not only do I think this is true and this is true, but the, I'm um, doing metaphorically, the earth as sun, I think other universes, and they, oh my God, what are you talking about? This is anti-religion at its core. Took him outside, lit a fire, and started burning him at the stake. Absolutely true story. Held the cross to him and said, do you change your story? I said, no, they burn him alive because he was trying to tell the truth. But inside the Vatican, the boys, the Cardinals, had a set story for this. They had little cool hats on, marble tables. They drank out of gold goblets. Is that the FDA? I don't know. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. They're sitting around the table, and, they, and they're, they're the scientists of the day, and they're going, this guy's crazy. We got, and it doesn't fit the narrative. And they killed him. They're killing people today by their reputation, social media, you know the deal. Because you're thinking outside the box. It's, 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 I would say that that is the nature of tribalism, which is inherent in the brain physiology and I think our interpersonal relationships as humans. That we have to kind of extract so much information and, and, you know, we, we take shortcuts and part of the social sh shortcuts that we do is an accepted components of social values and integrations and hierarchies within quote unquote, our tribe. And therefore anyone who's outside that tribal practices is now seen as someone who is a threat to your actual existence and therefore all actions can be justified by 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 in order to maintain quote unquote a sense of rationality or a sense of health or the good of the well-being because there's one of the other things of tribalism is interesting is that you project your um values or your reasons to do things as an extension of yourself to everybody else. And, and, and I think that's one of the dangers that we have when you give up too much authority to someone outside of yourself. I think you're, you're right. And it's probably been ongoing forever. Schopenhauer- yeah, it's part of the human condition, yeah. right? Yeah, it is. And Schopenhauer, I think, said it best because all new ideas go through three phases. Yes. First, it's just ridiculed, which I was, and I'm sure he was. But then they get angry with you, and they do with me. And then eventually they go, oh, we knew that. It's self-evident. No, you didn't. So back in the 1500s at the Flat Earth Society, I would say, they all... That's, that's peer reviewed, which is a really a stupid way to evaluate a new concept. What do you think you're going to get? I'm going to ask you, you, you. Everybody agree with the flat earth? Yes. This guy doesn't. Kill him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so true. It's so true. Because that's, again, tribal dynamics. Right. Um, you know, He's, when the, yeah. to, to explain this, I think when the Spanish conquistadors came to South America, the tribesmen could not see the ships on the water. Very good. Analogy. Because they had no frame of reference to see that. There was a visual thing as large as a ship sitting out there, which they could not witness until one of the shamanic members said, hey, I can see these ships and told the tribes, there's ships out there. And I think that illustration is perhaps maybe the best illustration and we associate it with another time and another place of hundreds of years ago. But that is a, 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 an expose of our own cognitive biases and the observation of information. I, I think that it fits the metaphor perfectly. And, and, and you can understand because you don't have a word for that. What's the word for uh, diabetes and Mandarin? 
I don't know. We never saw it before. So he takes somebody else's answer to the question, never looking at that fundamentally, because you would come to the conclusion, I think, that I did. And the Vatican, giving them credit. I mean, if I was, let, let's say, the 1500s, I think it's just a different point of view. So let's say I said to the, the cardinals, give me the, the town idiot, okay? And I'll take him. And I'll take him up and I'll sit on the moon and I'll ask him that question. Is that what you see flat or is it round? The idiot from a different point, he'd look and say, it's round. Because he has different, that doesn't mean he's smart or not smart. It just, he can see it from different, oh, like the ships, they appear. And to the most people, they, because they didn't have a word for it, so they couldn't make the eye can only uh, understand what it sees. So that is all interrelated to this concept of sugar and itis and the fibrosis and how we named all these diseases, which sound different. They're not different. They're different parts of the body. They have a different function, but it's the same process. So that's what I did with Sugar Crush. Uh, looked at autism. That's a very interesting one. I think that is nerve compression of the hypoglossal nerve, which is starts in the back of your brain and goes underneath your chin here, innervates the tongue. Because the first symptom is loss or delayed speech. Nerve, muscle, function. So why would that be? So I went to um, um, a famous person here at Barrow Neurologic Institute, and we started to discuss that. He, his name is John Stone, and he explained to me, he thought he's a, he's a neurogeneticist. So he's a smart, pretty smart guy from Stanford, as a matter of fact. And he said, it's a pre-genetic or pre-conception problem. So I dug it through the literature, and sure enough, there's an article, if anybody wants to read it, it's in Scientific American, uh, year 2000, written by an embryologist. And they looked at autistic spectrum disorder. They looked at the face of quote unquote normal against the spectrum kids and looked at them like, and they found at the band of age 22 days after conception to day 24, there was a protein that did not get deposited at the back of the brain, what they call the olive. And the difference between an autistic kid and a normal is 1.1 millimeter difference on day 22 to day 24. This is really good science, but they're embryologists. They're making observations. They don't know who Dellen is. They don't know who Cook is. They don't know who all these people I read. So I'm reading the article with these lenses on. Is right. this a nerve compression? I'm going to ask you and your audience. So here's the hypoglossal nerve, forms at day 22. Here's the distance between normal. Can you see that? Normal and abnormal. Yep. Here's a kid that's abnormal, doesn't have that one protein. Is that nerve compressed? Yes or no? Yes. It is. So delayed speech. Kids too, I need a drink of water. He can't pronounce, he can't communicate. So he kicks his foot through the wall. They psychobabble him, they medicate him. So he's sitting around or she, well, I, I don't know what else to do. So I'll learn to play the piano. I'll do numbers in my head through neuroplasticity. These kids are brilliant, but they can't speak. And they had different personalities, autistic spectrum disorder. So when that paper was written, it was written, there were 16 kids per 10,000 with autistic spectrum disorder. This year, one in 38. One in 38, soon to be one in two, according to Dr. Senna from MIT. And if you get her on, she'll give you even better dissertation on this subject than I do. So I went back and I said, wait a minute, that's the compression of the hypoglossal nerves. That's what, so I went to all the different nerves and I came up with this theory. 
And that's all it is. It's not proven. I'm, I'm, I wrote the book for a real sign. Maybe there's a scientist out there right now. It's going to say, I'm crazy. And that's the best way to disprove it. The null hypothesis. Prove me wrong. If you don't prove me wrong, you prove me right. That's what science is about. Put out new ideas, put it to the test, and, and they could come back, you know, you're kind of right, but you missed two other factors. That's fine, but it's a epigenetic process, I'm sure of. What's the trigger? It's sugar. It's that wow. simple. So is it sugar in the, with the child's consumption or is it sugar with the parents? Parents. So I would venture to say that most pregnancies in the United States and probably Canada are conceived with a six pack of beer and a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe two six packs, huh? Maybe more, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's Russian roulette. So <clears throat> the male has a set of alleles, mm -hmm. genes. Female, you spin that wheel more probability under those conditions that those genes are going to be in that offspring. And that's the output. Now, that is a really moral and ethical problem because if that is not looked at from this point of view, you're causing a kid to live the rest of his life with that defect. That's, in my mind, criminal. Not, not to mention the consequences to society at large because of the, the, the economic costs to, uh, to, to a society. Also, you know, societies essentially are set up to um, benefit from the efforts of its members through the taxation process. And so okay. now, instead of having a producer who is contributing to society, you have someone now who is dependent on it, putting further strain on those who are in the are capable of production. Yes. And they're going to be taxed. To, they're going to be slaves. They are slaves. I think you're more enslaved than we are mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. So that process is, you know, whole community is affected for sure. And it's not being solved. We're looking for a drug to solve it. That's not the answer. Uh, these kids are getting institutionalized. It's ruining marriages and communities and families in the state and community where you live. It's sugar. Prove me wrong. That should be an, a national crisis. It is a national crisis not being talked about. We're talking about COVID. Now, you cover this um, in your book, Yes, Sugar Crush, and I'm encouraging everyone out there to get this book, especially if you're thinking of conceiving of having a family because you've moved away from something that might be considered a degenerative condition at some point in the future, but your unawareness of this may be passing this on to your children unknowingly, which is it's one thing to do it unknowingly, but it, for those who are listening to this is saying, hey, you know what? You better consider the consequences of your choices now of how that's going to impact not only your kids, and, and obviously you don't want to compromise your kids, but also that's going to compromise your life significantly as well as, as the responsible individual who's brought this uh, being into the world and how much is that going to impact you and your contribution to society, your sense of happiness, your sense of connection with your partner, and of course, with your child as, at large, and then the bigger picture of society. So this is a huge, we're talking about this instrument, sugar, um, highly addictive, works inside our brain systems that, that, that our reward mechanism and our addictive behavior creating all these kind of fibrosis scarring, sclerosis, which are found in a variety of different conditions and have now become so pervasive and significant, it's now being passed on genetically into our offspring at a rate that is astronomical and not within normal genetic mutations. Would you say like we, the, the rise of autism does not fit any known scientific model uh, as far as normal genetic variants. This is obviously, there's, there's an Im impact. And this is understood 
I'm just summarizing everything to make sure I got it. There's a trauma plus sugar leads to dysfunction. And whether that's in the formation of a new embryo, whether that is the development of tunnel carpal syndrome, arterial sclerosis, multiple sclerosis, neuropathy, any of these conditions can be traced to trauma, sugar, dysfunction. Have I got that right? You nailed it. Sweet. We didn't talk about ALS because I think it even makes a better case because ALS is another nerve. It's, it's the um, 11th cranial nerve. Mm -hmm. And that is what well, we did discuss the ALS. Um, yes. But I didn't, the prevalence, so, or excuse me, ninth cranial nerve. The prevalence is 400% higher in our NFL. 400%. So that was the point I did make with the glossopharyngeal nerve. So a NFL lineman, would you say is a carbohydrate junkie? It's a requirement of the requirement. Position. That's a better word to get to 350 pounds because they right. pound, they pay by the pound in that league. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, de yeah, definitely. And it's harder to move a 350 pound guy than it is a 250 pound guy. Good observation. Would you say alignment, his neck would be hyperextended? Absolutely. Do you think it would get traumatized? Without fail. 400% higher incidence. 400, four times the average population. That argument alone needs to be investigated. I brought it to the NFL. They go to their silo, the ALS silo, which is here in, at, 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 at Barrow's Neurologic. I went to them, explained the theory. The eyes kind of get like glazed over what are you talking about? We are the authorities. What are you talking about? And they are the authorities. They know every gene mutation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They like stem cells, by the way. That maybe is the good segue because you can't reverse your parents. Correct. <laughs> so why don't we take yeah. that? So, so I, think we've, I think we've established a pretty good argument in around the a massive variety of conditions. And again, please, for everyone, we're gonna put all the links to the research in here, which you've done an extraordinary job of illustrating the point and the etymology of how you've come to this. Looks like a very strong theory that is gonna be very challenging to disprove in your book, Sugar Crush. But let's get into, okay, I get it. I understand the situation. You've made a compelling case. I need to take action in my life right now as a 30 year old, 40 year old, 50 year old, 60 year old, 70, wherever I am in life. I, I've probably taken on some damage here. I've probably made some choices that are leading me down the pathway to one of these conditions. And I wanna avoid that. What is the pathway forward right now? You know, it's actually pretty easy because you can't, well, I, can't, I guess you get new parents. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people that would want that one. But uh, I'm not in that category. I was very- Sounds that. You understand. Number yeah, one, yeah. get on a ketogenic diet. Number one, put butter in your coffee. I do it every day. Yep. It's not an easy transition, or at least wasn't for me when I did it 15 years ago. But the menu recipe items are out there, the food sources um, and the Bulletproof uh, guy, Asprey, he's done a phenomenal job getting attention on the ketogenic diet. We both had the same editor, by the way, at HarperCollins. Okay. I thought I thought of uh, buttered coffee, but he, he got, I went to my- Well, the originator of buttered coffee was actually Paul Check. I didn't know that. A lot of people don't know that. And it was picked up also by Laird Hamilton. Okay. Um, the the famous surfer. Okay. And then was then, uh, I think, picked up. And, and, and Dave Asprey did the world a great service about taking 
uh, composites of a lot of different research in variety of areas and compiling into one area because he had a lot of physical challenges of himself, had access to all the experts in the world and was getting poor results from that and said, I need to just figure this out myself. And while figuring out for himself, came up with the industry of biohacking and then, you know, the Bulletproof brand. And we've been very grateful for his contributions ever since. Which is a, yes. And, and, and this whole concept of this dialogue that we're having in, and from a political standpoint, see the dialogue we're having, why are we not having this dialogue on a national basis? We're being censored from all this stuff. Yes. You don't have to believe this listen to it, discuss it, argue it in a civil manner, exactly what we're doing. And, and More importantly, run the tests. Exactly. Run the tests and run an experiment in my life. What happens? So, so what are some of the tests I should run? I need to avoid this. What should I, what, what should I start doing? Yeah. How do I start applying yeah. this? So I would say ketogenic diet, number one, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, uh, number two, diet, trumps exercise you get more benefit from diet than you do from exercise but most younger guys think in the gym all day long they're going to be healthy yeah you're going to get big muscles and stuff but you're not going to be healthy just like i wasn't mm -hmm. so number two and i had this expression with stem cells and i'll explain i don't know how much time we have left We'll just keep going. This is just nothing but gold nuggets flying <laughs> around here. So we're going to well, let me start with stem cells. Okay, I'll Let's start with stem cells. So, so first thing, yeah. number one, ketogenic diet. Replace carbs with fat. Replace Good carbs. fats. Yep. Grass-fed anything. Butter, cream, meat. And the global warming thing is all part of this. The green deal is part of this because... I see that Bill Gates is really going against animals because he thinks that's the global warming, the methane. Well, he is right. It is. But you don't get rid of animals. I just had a great discussion before we came on with a gentleman who looks at large migrations of animals on planet Earth from a guy from Harvard. Animals are good for the environment. We just happen to be one of them. How do we fit in and how do they fit in? Like the bison, millions of bison, buffalo, when we first, the white man first got here, we killed them all. What were they eating? They were eating grass. They were in, improving the environment, not destroying it. What is the difference? When you eat grass, that goes for humans, the gas that we release is methane if you're eating sugar. Different chemical reaction, different gas, and that harms the environment. So the animals are not eating grass. They're eating corn. They're in CAFOs in, in, in um, Kansas, basically. Um, cows don't eat corn, unless that's the only thing for dinner, eat grass. So what's the difference? They make omega-3 fatty acids when they're eating grass. They make omega-6 fatty acids when they're eating corn and they release that gas, which is harmful for them and us and everybody else. And it ruins the environment. And now I would love to debate that with Bill Gates. No, you don't get rid of uh, cows. You get rid of the method we're feeding them with. You get back to the omnivores dilemma guy, uh, Paul, and he's, the, he's right on this subject. We're all in this together. So that's number two. Uh, number three, if you failed everything, stem cells. Now, this is what I say about stem cells, and I'll define that in a second. But I, this is what I said, and I said it years ago. Stem cells don't give a rat's ass what you call your itis to my book. Because they are ubiquitous. And stem cells are really not what the government does not want us to use the word stem cells. And they're right, even though they invented it, or Arnold Kaplan invented it, but everybody's used that word. So stem cell really is the basic building block that that's how we grow. So when you're, and I'll define the embryonic versus non-embryonic. 
Embryonic is not legal in the United States, is legal in lots of other countries. Does have some advantages, but it has some disadvantages, but it's not done here. So that is a fetus and usually from an aborted fetus. So Bush one said no in 2000, all research and stem cells stopped in the United States. The scientists went everywhere and then they discovered that perinatal tissue, that's the tissue of a live birth, placenta, amniotic fluid, umbilical cord, et cetera, had beneficial tissue in there and they thought that had stem cells. Technically, when it's processed, there aren't any stem cells. Doesn't matter, because that's not what works. So one of the best investigators, or the earliest one, was Neil Reardon. And he, he had a clinic in Dallas. He actually had a clinic here in, in Tempe, Arizona as well. He went to Costa Rica first. I think they threw him out of there. He landed in Panama. He did a lot of good research. He's using perinatal tissue. I visited with him there. I know very well. And oh, what define perinatal tissue for our audience? Perinatal tissue is the afterbirth of a live birth. So the when people say the water broke, that's it, the amniotic fluid. That's where the baby is bathed in. Mm -hmm. And has all the products of growth and, and secretions. FDA says, you know, that's a, that's a drug. That's a big debate on that going on right now. That's a drug because it has secretions and can have an effect. Big Pharma would like to own this space and they probably will because right. it works and it's safe. And it, and it, but. Only they'll, of, they'll, they'll build a, deriv a synthesized derivative. Oh, it'll be. Stuff it'll as be far from the actual, yes, right? Totally. So is it safe? Absolutely. I've had it done to myself three times. One for a back injury. I played tennis. I tore Achilles tendon and I had a severe shoulder problem. I injected myself. I, I play tennis. I run. I'm, I'm fine. My back is, is perfect. So that's why I say stem cells don't give a rat's ass what you call your itis, whether it's radiculopathy of your back or a rotator cuff or Achilles tendon disruption, doesn't matter to stem cells. And they're not stem cells. The growth factors in those fluids. They're like, say you're gonna build a house. You got 500 workers, you got an electrician, a carpenter, a cement guy, architect. They all come to the problem and say, what's the problem? Well, we got a, a break here. They, they go to work and they fix it. That's how it works. Way more complicated than that, but simplistically stated, they don't give a red sass. Now, I'll give you the scientific proof for that. Two years ago in China, they did an experiment. They took a rat, they took the sciatic nerve, sectioned the sciatic nerve, took a cut out of it, put a neural tube in, injected exosomes, which are a derivative of stem cells, mm -hmm. the nanoparticles, and sacrificed these rats on a weekly basis. And they started to see these little axons, the small little nerve fibers growing across the gap. Hence, stem cells don't give a rat's ass what you call uritis. That's the scientific proof of that sentence. And it's true. So, so just yeah. from that, is it the exosomes which are doing the work or the stem cells? I believe it's the exosomes. I see. And the, the scientific terminology for that, which is interesting, it's called their cargo. Uh -huh. They're little vesicles. So you have an MSC, a, a mesenchymal stem cells. And they secrete these, you can, under the microscope, you can see if these little bubbles come out of it and they have a little bubble that's called a vesicle. Inside that vesicle are these exosomes, billions of them. And they work not in the endocrine system, but in the paracrine system. What is that? That's the fluid that connects all cells throughout your body. And that just goes through there. And basically um, what they do is they look at every cell. And I believe this is how they work. They look at the cell 
and they measure their electrical potential of that cell. If it's too low, apoptosis, they kill them, they're gone. If it's the cell material can be enhanced, you see a little pseudopod go out, this is proven, into the cell and it brings the cell back to normal. So every cell in the body gets the communication from wherever you inject it. And um, there's some really good studies on the exosomes, but government doesn't like us using exosomes the other way. Kind of, I, I'm not sure exactly why, not enough research, yes, that's true. Are they safe? Of course they're safe. They're in our bodies all the time. Every liquid has an exosome, a microcargo vesicle, but they carry information. That's really what they are. And they're gonna go and fix anything they can. It, and, and I think there's a spectrum, and I talk about it in the book, Sugar Crush, but to a very little detail in my new book, I will. But I think there's a spectrum from inflammation to fibrosis. Further are along the line to fibrosis, like what I do, at that point, you probably have to do the surgery. I put them into five phases, one, two, three, four, five. Phase one, change your diet, vitamins, all the natural stuff, you're gonna be fine. Phase two, a little bit more intense, maybe you gotta add a little secret sauce in there versus you know simple things. Phase three, you're probably getting into a surgical problem. Phase four, you definitely are. And say phase five, I'm not even sure the, the surgery is gonna work. That's the gangrene phase. And if it's a sudden death, you're dead. So you really need to heed the clarion sign, change your diet. Why is the government not telling us this? Let's talk about COVID and stem cells. So in Wuhan, they had a couple of people in the ICU, tried everything, they gave them exosomes, then they walked out of the hospital in two days. They don't, give, they don't care what caused it. So why is COVID such a pandemic, aside from the political portion of it? And was it weaponized? I don't know. Well, let's say it wasn't. Let's just, just say it's a bad dude in town. So I say to my patients, don't be a host. And I mean by that is sugar, in my opinion, because I'll give you why my opinion, which is not in the book, but the chemistry is, at this hospital, which is right across the street here, or actually on the same campus, Scottsdale Memorial Hospital, Osborne, because you want to know where I'm at, 94% of the patients over there in ICU have diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. 94%. The, this is the part that's not being released to the public is about the comorbidities Correct. that are, they're, they're racked up as a COVID death. Yes. But what it is, is it's a COVID death stacked on already a degenerative condition with serious consequences that's kind of like the final knockout punch from a T Mike Tyson combination. The first two to the body softened them up before the uppercut came and knocked them out. Yep. So I, I say herd immunity kind of fits this whole scenario because it's sugar. So what is the sugar doing? Well, on page 25 of my book, I actually talk about it, but not viruses. I'm just talking about the biochemistry. So if you look at the book, and this is Dr. Cook stuff, who now is, by the way, ironically, is at Baylor. He is head of stem cell research for the United States, and he's working on 10 or 12 vaccines as we speak. Wow. Yes. I talked to him. John, why aren't we getting this message out? Well, I mean, the money's in the vaccine, I'm not saying don't eat sugar. I just said it. I get, did you give me a nickel for that? You know, it's funny. I um, was discussing this with a friend of mine today who contacted me recently. And I said, look, uh, Warren Buffett uh, said in his investing book that one of the things that he tries to account for every year in his financial analysis of companies is to factor in perverse incentives into his models that 
lead to behaviors of individuals and companies which aren't necessarily in the best interest of society or that company. And he goes, every year I think I've accounted for it appropriately. And at the end of the year, I reassess and realize I have not calculated appropriately for perverse incentives. And we are talking about a worldwide phenomenon where there are government probably mandated or certainly make your life extremely difficult if you have not been vaccinated with built by companies which you have no legal recourse of any potential consequences down the road to you or to your family members you cannot sue them you cannot have a legal recourse they are not liable for them for for those people taking it and the chances are you're going to have to need more than one shot and it might end up that we're taking shots every six months government regulated and let's say they're making a hundred bucks a shot well, you times that by seven or eight billion people on the planet, because it won't get to a lot of people who don't have access in, in the more rural aspects. Well, now we're talking about trillions of dollars without any legal recourse for anyone. And that is as big of perverse incentives. And who do these institutions fund on political candidacy? So political candidates need to come into power and this requires a lot of money in order to buy the cognitive space inside people's brains to get involved in whatever narrative of whatever political thing that you need, that you believe is going to make society better, whether it's lower taxes or environmentalism or whatever the mathematical algorithms has spit out from the data advisors to the political candidate into the party that would probably get the most amount of votes. Because it's not about, can we make a better society? It's, can we get to power first? And then who do we have to give back uh, our kickbacks? Who, who are part of the funding so that we can get their say in the debate, it's like, well, we got this, yes, we got so-and-so into the White House or we got so-and-so into the provincial government or the local government or whatever it happens to be. But when big companies write a check for some reason, they're not doing so because they're being altruistic about a political campaign. There, there's one political party or some political parties that are advantageous for that corporation. That's the nature of a corporation. So you can stay, take away all the stuff and politicization and all that sort of stuff. You just have to follow a logical aspect of human behavior and how our system works and why this doesn't come out to the population. And then you have a whole, maybe our most intelligent driven class the doctors, the legal teams, the uh, people of Silicon Valley who produce the, how we get the information, what is the correct information and what actions we take on that information. And we silo those into certain groups, into their own tribes so that we can create division amongst them. And, and anybody that steps outside of that and says, hey, we're not the center of the universe or they're not the center of the universe now potentially can be burned at the stake as a conspiracy theorist. And in that case, in this world, you are just publicly shamed so that you cannot support yourself economically. Would that be accurate? Oh, you better be careful. You're in Venice. You're in the heart of that whole, what should you say, cabal? It's an interesting state. I wrote a book a number of years ago, which calls the rise of the digital Republic. And in today's world, I felt that large digital corporations had exceeded the influence of the traditional uh, nanny states that we have come to depend on for our life. And things like Google and Amazon and Facebook and Netflix and YouTube now have more attention units of the population and more influence of the population than our political machines. And therefore they are actually in control and it's uh, less uh, and less by our nation states. And so- you know, interesting way you, you couch that argument. Um, when I was writing the book, I, I always wondered why the first caucus was in Iowa. 
no one really lives there, but that's where the money is. So they all go there to get the check. Mm -hmm. Hi, Hillary. Good to see you again. How much do you need this year, et cetera? You're a fool. You're not going to get elected. One guy by the name of Trump, I don't need your money. Bernie, yeah, here's some money. But they buy, they bet on every horse because they're going to win. Right. Now, under the farm bill, which is a trillion dollars, by the way, they don't grow any corn. So how's it, where's that trillion going? Well, to the political parties, but here's how it gets broken down. And there's a guy that, um, you remember McGovern, George McGovern? I do. Yeah. And he was starting all this uh, nutrition stuff. And I, I thought the name was interesting. When you think about it in retrospect, Mick Govern, Mick Donalds, it, it's a numb nut approach to anything. Mm -hmm. you know? And his name is McGovern. He wanted good nutrition. Well, he really didn't. He was from wheat producing area. They couldn't sell that crap. So he gets in there and said, We're gonna, I'm going to get involved in nutrition. So they came up with um, the idea, food for peace. That means we couldn't sell it. We get the taxpayer money. We get it and we send it. One of the places they sent it to was Afghanistan. They were producing a lot of wheat and corn and that it killed their economy. Now they're producing poppy seeds, you know, heroin. Right, which is fun in China, and now we have yeah. a, a, an opioid crisis. Yeah, and we have all that deal. States. So the other thing they did was the school lunch program, cheese and all that stuff they couldn't give away, so they give it to the kids. And number three, they fund the National Institute of Health. That's what out of the farm bill. So those grants are going to go to the universities. That's where the money goes. So I go to a university and I've done this and I have a great idea, I think, to explain all this microbiome. I'll give you the theoretical, what I did, but it actually happened <laughs> by just use some other names, other universities. Says so university, hey, we like your idea. So why don't you come over and explain it to me? I did. Uh, several times. And wow, that's pretty good. We'll get back to you. Never did. Because I used the word glyphosate. Mm -hmm. And that's what I said was the problem. So I never got funded. Well, this particular university is funded by, of all people, Monsanto. And I'm in there like an idiot being debriefed by the enemy. That's how they do it. So that's where the money is. It's another government agency. So people argue, you know, private industry, big government. No, it's all a big circle. Big farming creates the disease. Big pharma solves the disease and big government facilitates the disease. And here we are. That's so COVID. COVID is, in my opinion, sugar. How does that work? Let's get your audience, whatever room they're in, if you're in a room, think of that as a lung cell, okay? You become a lung cell with me, and I'll take you through this little trip. So you're a lung cell, you're breathing in, you're breathing out, you're producing, taking a, it's carbon dioxide, you want to make some oxygen, that's, that's your job. But you're eating a lot of sugar. Sugar molecule competes with vitamin C. Vitamin C doesn't get in the cell, sugar does. Causes your white cells to get in a fight with the, with the sugar cells and it causes inflammation. So now you're at risk. So vitamin C is essential for the conversion of L-arginine to nitric oxide. Let's go back to Cook and his molecule asymmetric dimethyl arginine. Try to make it simple. You have to visualize this. So that molecule is blocking the conversion of L-arginine to nitric oxide, number one. Number two, there's another chemical that facilitates this conversion from L-arginine to nitric oxide. And it's got a big word, tetrahydrobiopterin. Tetra We'll call that BH4. BH4 is made up of B6, 
B12, folic acid, and our good friend, vitamin C. If you don't have vitamin C, you downregulate and you'll convert not nitric oxide, but peroxynitrite. If you produce nitric, uh, if you produce nitric oxide, you have a lot of oxygen. If you don't, you have peroxynitrite. You will, your O2 levels will go down and you will die. It's not, it's not a, it's not a, a, a symptom of getting the lungs moving. It's a function of exchanging the oxygen. That's why they put a ventilator on, to your point, $39,000 from Medicare. It doesn't solve the problem. Stem cells do, vitamin D does, vitamin C does, little zinc does, melatonin. And if you really have a problem, take some dexamethasone, which they do, or you can um, use a convalescent plasma, which is somebody who had the disease and do that, and that works. Should we be vaccinated? In my personal opinion, the answer is no. We should look at not being a host, but I'm not in charge. So everybody's gonna get vaccinated probably for the rest of their life. And they're yelling at me. And with that, let's, let's think about the function of sugar and inflammation and fibrosis as you so well described it. It's pervasive, it's insidious, and it's deadly. And Dr. Jacoby, this has been fantastic. Where can people find out more, get your book, and do you do any uh, educational components that people can access? I do a lot of podcasts like this. I think we're very educational. It's on Amazon, unless they took it down after my comments today. <laughs> <It's impossible. laughs> um, that's the best way. And if you do get the book, write a comment or email me, I'll answer it. Because this is such a huge problem that's very easily solved. One last question before you go. Do you equate sugar from fruits the same yes. as sugar from? Yes, I do. And they all have been changed as well. Got it. Thank you very much for joining us today. And Thank you. for all of us listening, that's Dr. Jacoby. His book is called Sugar Crush, an enlightening conversation about the complexity of the human condition and what seems like multitudinous of diseases actually may have a singular cause. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you again on the Awesome Health Podcast. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, share it, like it, smash it, or comment about it. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care. At Bioptimizers, our mission is to fix digestion. And a cornerstone of digestion is gut flora. P3OM is our patented probiotic formula. In fact, we call it the Navy SEALs of probiotics. You see, Strong proteolytic or protein digesting activity is paramount to having a healthy gut flora. And of course, P3M provides that. The good news is, unlike weaker probiotics, P3OM survives the digestion process. What it does is it basically multiplies the good guys while protecting you against pathogens or what some people call the bad guys. P3OM really helps to rebuild your digestion. And what that allows you to do is to maximize nutrient uptake, energy, and metabolism. To find out more of how P3OM can help you, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com.